Smoker that's back. I'm Anne Marie Batterstone on NCTV. I'm just delighted to be here because I've had a hiatus because I had to recover from an eye surgery. So that's I've I've been away, but I'm back and I have a very interesting guest who is Ed Haddad. He's a resident over at Rivers Edge, and he has some concerns and some uh, comments about what's going on with the town government. And I've, he's been attending meetings, and I've seen him there, and so I have him here today. Oh, thank you so much for coming. Nice on. to meet you. Yes. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, no, not at all. Now, what, what is your background? My background, I'm retired now, but I'm a, by uh, education, I'm an accountant. I was trained to be an accountant. I did accounting for many years, and then I worked at New Balance Athletic Shoe. As a, I was a vice president, and I did a lot of things. I ran oh. their, uh, after I left finance, I ran their international business, and then the last fifteen years of my career, I ran the legal department within oh. the town, and I did manage intellectual property, counterfeits, trademarks, patents, things like that. You had attorneys working for you. I had attorneys working for me, and I managed our attorneys around the world because really? you. When you have a lawsuit in a country, you, you have to have a local law firm. It's, so. an, it's a global company, certainly. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's what my last years was learning a whole new area. So you have some expertise in all of that. I know you've been interested in the budget issues. Well, that's my training. So I, I did that a long time at New Balance. I did a lot of forecasting and budgeting. Uh, it's a large company, certainly, and, and we dealt with large budgets, worldwide budgets, as a matter of fact. So... I have a lot of experience in that, so it's a, it was a natural coming here to the, the, and trying to understand the finances and what was going on in town. And actually, how that first came up was we got my tax bill, you know. And obviously, you know, when you see your tax bill, we have a high, a lot, very high tax rate in in Norfolk compared to where I came from. And uh, it was like, was it a comparable town? It was Needham. Uh, a, oh, really? A town. Oh, but you have all that. You have a big tax base, though. A lot of business base. Yeah, we so have that. a big industrial park there, and uh, that, that makes a huge difference. And uh, unfortunately, Norfolk doesn't have that same thing. So we got a very high tax bill, and certainly the concern is like, wow, what, what's going on the, you know, to cause such a, a tax bill? So uh, first we started going to town meetings, I think, just to try to understand the process. And, and what I learned was actually you really have to take the time to understand how government run, how especially town government. It's a very different language. You know, the way they do things is different than private industry. Although the basics are the, of accounting are the same, they do things differently, different vocabulary. And I felt that, well, I need to make the commitment to, to learn if I really want to understand what's going on here. And that's what, how I got involved. There's a few of you interested in this over there at River's Edge. There's quite a few, quite a few of us all of a sudden because it just so happens that our community, it's a newer community, and it was really what started is the tax bills. We got very high tax bills, you know, and it raised the concerns, what's going on, why are our taxes going up, how is the town, and that leads to how is the town spending our money right. kind of thing. Um, and unfortunately, about the same time that I came into town, this issue of the police station mm. happened to hit at the same time, which obviously is a spending issue. And um, so the, the, between the two together, uh, we decided we needed to find out more as to you know, what really goes on here. Not, not wrong or anything, but just to understand how the town finances work. Now tell me something. How much did it go up this past because I, I I don't know any I mean I I don't know anything about all of that stuff I I'm not a, how much did it go up do you well, know well within our community I mean that's all I can speak to within our community the majority of the people experienced about a twelve percent increase but th that would have been across the across town wouldn't it I don't think so uh, well, you think you were assessed differently well we're not that we're assessed differently but it's it's easier because we're a commun we're a condo community. So it's easy, you know, when we've spoken to the a, a tax assessor, it's based on sales, you know, and because we're a, a closed group, it's easy to evaluate recent sales, and that's what they base assessments on. See, that seems kind of unfair, though, doesn't it? Well, we, I don't know what, to be honest with you, I don't know what the rest of the town is experiencing. I just know our community, so I'm not quite sure how. I think the, everyone's went up. I would, Because I've heard some other people complain. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. <clears throat> I just don't know yet. Because I don't know a lot of 12%? people. Twelve percent. Twelve percent. Oh 
Oh my God. Twelve percent. Our assessments went up quite a bit, and then the, ultimately the tax the tax rate itself went up a little bit, That's about right. thirty cents. Oh, I see what you're saying. Oh, so okay. between the assessments going oh, up oh. and then the tax rate going up, right, it resulted in a tax increase of about twelve percent. That's quite which a is lot. which is quite a lot. Yeah. yeah, which is quite a lot. You know, especially and, given the value of those houses over there, I imagine. Yeah, yeah, it's quite a lot. Again. Norfolk has one of the highest tax rates in the area because we have no industry to absorb the tax rates like some towns do. And I've always, it's the same as Medfield, and I used to live in Medfield. I couldn't afford to buy in Medfield, and I always yeah. felt like there, there was more value in Medfield. I mean, the way yeah. the town was set up and the services and, and so forth. So now, what, what, have you, what have you learned uh, if you've been observing some of these? Well, what we've learned, I think the first thing, like I said, that was that's still an ongoing issue is this issue of the police station. Um, the poli there's been no explanation about that. There's been no explanation yet. Uh, we, we are, at least our group, has asked the select board and the town administrator several times. At the fall town meeting, they had the town attorney there, and he did explain that right now they're still going through a process of understanding what happened, because I don't know if all your viewers know, but the... the Police station um, budget overran by almost two and a half million dollars. Uh, it went up so high. It's astonishing. It, it's astonishing. I mean, how did it get away from them that fast? I mean, don't don't you know it was? I mean, as things are going along, that that it's it's a, you know it's getting out of control. Well, that's what we want to understand. So I guess they're evaluating what happened just to see if there's any legal issues here. Is there a lawsuit involved here? Did someone do something wrong? We don't know, and, and they're evaluating it. And what we were told at town meeting was that while they're evaluating it, they don't want to reveal what's going on. But they assured us that at some point we're going to get an explanation because we have another big pro We have actually several big projects coming up. And certainly a concern is if that one project, we lost control of it, what happens when the next one comes exactly. up? You know, that, and that's our concern. But that's so. What percent? Uh, now I remember them saying something about um, I don't know what they call them adjustments or corrections or something. There's a name for it in building. It was something like thirty-five work orders. Yes, it was something like thirty-five change percent orders. change orders. Change orders. Yeah. <clears throat> it was something like thirty-five percent. Yeah. Were change orders. And and cost overruns usually are a result of change orders because they have they change the the, the process and then the original estimates then get sort of thrown out out the window. Because I've heard that they they sent a, a, a demand letter to the architect, yeah. but I mean, is the architect really? I don't know. In That's what we need to know. I, I mean, I don't think typically. That's what we that need to I know. I think the architect, you know, oversees and draws the draws and sees that everything's. But as far as managing. The project. Well, that's that's an interesting point. The management is is the issue. There there was a building committee. Uh, I I can't recall that I uh, or I even know who was on the building committee, but I know I think the select board yes. was, and uh, and I'm sure some other people. I think the the, the chief, the, the police probably chief, probably the chief. Um, so I'm not quite sure what their role was, what their accountability is. I don't know. You know, again, we haven't heard the details, and I'm too new to the town to really have known it. So I'm waiting myself to hear what's going on. Well, I don't know why those roles can't be clarified well, without, are, without impacting any kind of a lawsuit. Well, the, the whole <laughs> issue of a building committee is actually in the town bylaws. I checked the town bylaws, and the town bylaw does call for a building committee if the project is over X percent of, of, of cost, and certainly the police station would have been. So it does call for, uh, for a uh, building committee to oversee the project, and it, out, it even outlines who will be on that building committee. So the town does need one. Was that consistent with what the, who the members? Oh, you're not I, sure? I don't know who the members were. Yeah, I don't know the members yet. Now, why would why would people who are not professionals be overseeing it? I mean, th well, there, you wouldn't there must want been... that. You would no. not want that because obviously, how can they monitor the a project if they if they don't have the skills in the background to to know what's going on? You'd want maybe lawyers or financial people, engineers, certainly builders. Uh, you'd want people that have the expertise in those fields to be on that committee because they would have the knowledge. 
to be able to address things like change orders or changes in costs that, that come up. I think the facilities director, Matt, I don't know his last, I think he was overseeing it. Maybe so, maybe so. You know, again, I, and, and, I, and I don't know what his qualifications would be for that kind of a project. Exactly. For that kind of project, <clears throat> I don't know. So we're, one of the things we've, we have asked the selectmen is that we want them to establish a permanent building committee in town with the appropriate personnel, with the appropriate backgrounds and skills, because we've got a school project coming up with a proposal for the addition at Freeman Kennedy. We have a proposed new fire station coming up. Um, so certainly big projects that would, would, uh, you would want to have a, a building committee in place looking at the plans now and really start guiding the projects as they go along. So this, in other words, you wouldn't be the different building, a, a different committee for each project? Not necessarily. <coughs> Not necessarily. Because you, you, could, you could change some of the people, like, for example, on the school, you might have school committee people that certainly would be on it. And on the fire station, you would have fire station people. But the people with the expertise, like the builders, the engineers, the lawyers, the, and the accountants, so to speak, they could be uh, on both. You know, I, in my experience, and I mean, I, I really just started paying close attention a few years ago, but I, I haven't seen a lot of those types of professionals coming forward. Yeah. And I could be mistaken, but I think you have a different cohort in Needham yeah. than here. Well, Needham does have a permanent building committee. And that started when several years ago, while we were in town, there was a school project, and the school project was a disaster. It was an absolute disaster, cost overruns, and as a result of that, the town recognized the need and they, they established a permanent building committee with appropriate members. And we had other building projects and we've never had a problem. We never had a problem in Needham again. Did they get to the bottom of that? The first one? Which you mentioned. It was just, um, not the word incompetence, but you just don't have people with the right skills managing the project. You have like the principal of the school. Yes, right, well, right. The principal doesn't have the right, right skills right. to manage a construction project. They manage a school, not a construction project. You know, and people think, well, because they're involved, exactly. it's a school thing, well, we exactly. need to have the principal. Exactly. It's not the same no. thing. You know, and that's what happened with it. They just didn't have the right skills on the. So on was the there? There must have been a big reaction, and I imagine they were people were. There was a big reaction. There was a big, and it wasn't even just cost. It was also the quality. There were quality issues with the, with the construction. Things had to be redone. You wouldn't and, think uh, in need them. I wouldn't. You wouldn't think so, but it could happen anywhere. It, it's a very simple thing because if you don't have the right skills managing the project. Well, I don't think a lot of people in town know they what the issue. All the issues that, that in that safety building, I don't think a lot of people know about the, the overruns. They may not. I know. Like I said, we found out at, uh, at at select board meeting and just talking. I mean, we I happened to get a letter that was that Blythe issued to the select board, and, and we were at the meeting when it when it came out. That's why I was able to get a copy of it. And this was dated May first, and it explains it was last spring. Yeah, it was last spring. It oh, explains. Yes. It explains the, the, the whole issue, the amounts of the overruns. As far as she could find as out. Far, at that time. That's right, right. At that time. And it really was more of a cost issue. You know, this is what happened cost-wise. Mm -hmm. And it even referred back to in December what, uh, when the town, at town meeting, they appropriated $12 million for a fire station and a police station. And now, because of the overrun in the police station, uh, there isn't sufficient funds now for the fire station. Right, in plain English. Right, and so that what that ultimately is going to mean for the, the taxpayers in, in Norfolk is that we're going to be asked for either an override or a debt exclusion or something to pay for the fire station now because we've run out of money. Now, what is a debt exclusion? The debt exclusion is it doesn't become part of your tax bill oh, okay. all the time. It's, it's, you pay for it while it's being financed, and then it drops off. So that's a debt exclusion. It's just a way of how it builds into your taxes. Now, um, what you've been also been attending the advisory board meetings. I just went to the first. Well, again, as a result of the going to town meeting, what we've learned is you know in, un, in trying to understand the budget process, which is in process right now, as a matter of fact, is that the department heads review or prepare their budgets. 
and then they ultimately get reviewed by the advisory board. Now, the advisory board in some towns is called the finance committee. Right. Some towns is called the advisory but board. But those it's aren't necessarily financial people either. Am well, I right? We don't know. Oh, we don't, I don't know. We don't know because the town bylaw, although it calls for an advisory board, it doesn't. It doesn't spell out qualifications. So the uh, interestingly, it's kind of unusual, but it's not unusual is that the advisory board is appointed by the town moderator, not by the select board, which yep. is unusual to I understand. Think so. yeah, it's, it's really unusual Well, he to just understand. recently, uh, I guess they put in a, um, an amendment or an article so that he, he's, he's in for three years at a time. He used to be yes, elected every year. Every year, right. So he now, just got elected for three years. Now, I was on the advisory board a very long time ago, and it was way over my head. I remember at the time, there was a man there who was the... He was the finance director for Wellesley, but lived here in Norfolk. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty. It was pretty complicated. They're pretty complicated discussions. They're very complicated. But I know not everybody on there was at his level. I think the the, the chair was a was an a, a attorney, um, but and there were some real estate people. But I don't think there were, as I remember. I mean, yeah. You know, it's just my recollection. Budgeting is a very complex issue. It depends on how you do it. Now, one of the things that's been requested at town, uh, at the sort of select board meeting, and even one of the selectmen has recommended it also, is a zero-based budget. Now, what that means is, is that you build your budget. You just don't take your last years and layer on a percent increase. Which is what they've been doing. Yes, that's what they've been doing. So, in other words, nobody has to come forward and say, I need this, and nobody asks why. No. And they don't have to justify it. No. They just, well, that's they just, just, where does that all end? Well, that's the problem. It does the problem. It's, uh, what we, what we, the result is, is you just in, keep increasing your costs without really understanding how those costs are being spent. And that's really the, the, the way you should want to do a budget so you understand really how your money is being spent. Now, I think you must have been at this meeting, but wasn't there something about that uh, I was, it was a, it was a, a Chris Weeder had said that he thought that the departments should come to the board of selectmen and then go to advisory and then go back. Am I right about what you were You're that? right at that meeting. That's what was said. But what I understand is happening now on February 8th, there's an all day advisory board budget review day with the select board. Really? Yes. It's an all day session. We don't have, you haven't seen Is the that a schedule. That must be a Saturday. That's a Saturday. Oh, I didn't know it was going all day. It's yeah. supposed to be starting at 10 well, o'clock? It's, it's supposed to be starting at 10 o'clock. It's not open to issued, the public. It, of course. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a public meeting, open meeting. We haven't got the schedule of the departments when they come in. Publicized enough. When they come in, we don't know that. It's very hard to understand how you're going to do so many budgets, even in a short time, because some of those budgets are very complicated to understand. Mm. And I'm not saying there's anything mm -hmm. wrong with them, but even just understanding, they're very complicated. Just think of the school department. That's a huge operation. And they pretty much get what they want by state law, I believe. Well, I don't know about that. I don't know how state law dictates it, but certainly... We want to make sure that the schools are run properly and and what they need and and certainly without large, waste. Without waste, and, and the largest part of a school budget, I, I believe, is also your salaries, your right. teachers. Right. Right. You know, so a lot of it is fixed. We know that. You know, so it's well, understandable. Well, the class size is very small. I don't know the class size. It the keeps class changing. size is seventeen. Well, that's very low. Yes. So um, then you need more teachers. Then you need more teachers. Well, you need the more room. theoretically, what you should have, and I don't know if we have one yet. As a matter of fact, I was planning on calling the superintendent Alardi and asked her the question: Is do we have a standard that our school committee has set as a, as a target, just for that reason, so that when you're well, when point. you're doing staffing, you know, if you have a target, let's say the target is 19, well, then you have a target to so know when you have a when, when you, how many teachers you need, and when do you need to hire new teachers? Well, the DO, Department of uh, DOE, rather, Department of Education has those standards. Now, whether the towns want to have a lower number is something else. And then it's like a it's like a drop in a pond when you change that number. You when bring you that, number that number down. It affects a lot of things, of course, of course. I mean. Of course. And the thing about school populations is they, is they also don't stay stagnant. 
I mean, they vary up and down. So one year you might have, a, let's say, a fifth grade, and the average teacher's uh, classroom size is 18, and then all of a sudden it, it changes, and for those same number of teachers, it drops to 16. Yeah. It, it could because the, the, the population changes. Well, you know, I, I, was, I was a teacher for 30, 34 years, and, but it was in Boston, completely, completely different situation. Yeah. But when those kinds of things happen, I mean, if they, they can end up accessing a teacher, but usually they may try to move people around they or give people around. other duties, yeah. Yeah. say, if their class size is very low, or, I mean, there's, there's, there's different ways yeah, of and handling it, and it's not probably, always fair. I mean, I well, remember... Well, probably what they do, because if that same population that was larger moves on, they probably are short exactly. teachers, so they, they reallocate them to another grade. And, you know, I remember uh, also seeing something uh, on one of, the, uh, one of the screens about a, 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 a population much higher back in, I think it was 2010. I know, and somebody mentioned, and then, and then it was much lower... And that, and but the um, the spending didn't see. I mean, I'm I'm talking out of my depth here, but the yeah. spending didn't seem to have changed much. Well, like I said, a lot of the costs are fixed because there there there's teachers contracts so that you that you have to abide by, and then any employee, whether it's teachers or any of the thing, a large part of your costs is taxes and benefits. Health costs are very high, and they keep going up. As a matter of fact. You know, there's fixed, and the, the only way you can change those is you have to change your headcounts. So, so that becomes very difficult to manage. So you could be stuck with fixed costs, whether your population goes up or, or even when it goes down, you could be facing a lot of fixed costs. And there's, and there's other things in, in the school. That, that's why I say the school budget is complex because you have technology. You want to make sure that the kids are updated with the, with the most recent technologies, you know, textbooks are costs are expensive. You know, supplies are expensive. So it's a very complicated budget. Um, it's a matter of judgment too, yeah. I think, because I've, I've never understood why it was necessary for these very young children to be learning how to use computers. I, I, I mean, I don't, I don't see if if you've got an X amount of money and it's limited. I mean, some of these things to me seem like they're a lot less necessary. Than it would be for them when they're maybe a little older. Well, I think the argument uh, to the, that is is I, that I th pinch... that's where the world is. So you need to they need to be trained to be very comfortable using these things because in in many places now computers we, they don't use calculators anymore. They don't even read the way we used to when we were right. in school. It's a very different world because of technology, and they have to be they have to be well prepared. Well, I think a really important thing is that people go to these meetings yeah. and, and at a minimum watch on, a, on NCTV. Well, that's what the point is. You, and have to you know. really have to be there because a lot of times there's dynamic that goes on that you see and, and things that you, that you hear that you might miss. And, and you can ask questions. You that's can, the good well, part, that's too. At the selectmen's meeting, you can now. Yes, that's well, true. That's a new thing. You know, that's new. It was never the case before. What, asking questions? Oh, no. Really? No. Oh. I mean, I suppose if you came forward and you, you know, but that business of people coming up and talking yeah. at the beginning, no, that's that's new with the, with the new board. Oh, really? Because I know at other boards that I've been to, they do allow us. Now you know that when they when the public comes up first, if an item is not on the agenda, the select board is not allowed to deliberate. On oh, I know. Yes, yeah, that's you right. You understand yeah. that? I don't know if the public understands that. Right. You right. Know? Well, yeah. I mean, I mean, you could you know you could petition to go up there and talk to them, but. To me, there's a there's a freedom about it now, and I think there's a little more enthusiasm. People feel, well, you know, I have this idea; I'll just go up and I can speak, you know. But um, it, and you can request something to be put on the agenda, right? If you, if it's something you'd like them to discuss with you, you can send it send a because I've done that. Send a note to uh, the head of the select board or the town manager and just say, I have this uh, item that I would like you to consider to put on the agenda. So your group over there, are they, are they is somewhat cohesive in that there's a group of people over there that's interested, that sort of wants to... Yeah, they're, they're very interested right now. Again, once you start getting involved and you start learning the different processes and the different boards that are involved with things, like you become more interested, actually, and you find out that it's a lot more complex than you originally thought. You can't go into town meeting and make a criticism or ask a question when you really don't understand the background. Well, and to be quite frank with you, I mean, I think you must have seen this. Sometimes you're, you're, <laughs> some comments are not welcome. 
Yeah, that's right. You know, and uh, I mean, you know, they have that candidates night, and uh, you know, we people send car write on cards to have you know questions asked, and not every card gets asked. Correct. Yeah, which is not good. That's not good, yeah. yeah. But well, listen, we're just about out of time here. Well, that, that we, went fast. You come back that went by fast. My <laughs> it goodness. Did indeed. So, can you come back another time sure, when you've got I'd more love information? To. Yeah. I, I, there's a lot of information, like I said, in getting involved with the town, there's a lot of interesting things that I, I think the average resident really doesn't understand no. because they, they don't have the time to get involved. They're working, they're parents right. with young kids. But it's crucial. It's crucial. And I think they it's feel, crucial. well, it's this, Yeah. but it affects everybody. You know, I say, well, I, I don't have kids in the school, or I don't, or, but it's, it, it, like, again, it's like a, a drop of water, and it really affects everything. Everything. You have to, you have to realize, what do you want for your town? What do you want your town to be? That's right. What do you want your schools to be? And if you have, if if you if you're not involved, you then you you, you don't know what you're going to get. That's right. That's very true. Yeah. Well, so thank you so much for coming on. I expect to thank see you, you again. We definitely and maybe will. some of your friends from from Rivers Edge. They would love to cohorts. come and speak with you. A lot of interesting people. <laughs> but thank you for watching NCTV. I'm Anne Marie Battistone. This was State and Local. My guest was Ed Haddad from Rivers Edge. We've been talking about some budgeting issues uh, in the town. And try to try to watch these shows on TV. These uh, I'm not talking about these shows, but the, the the meetings. Very important. Thanks for watching.